Good evening and welcome to each of you. It's time to travel, so fasten your seatbelts, if you will, as the lights go out. Our journey this evening is one of my very favorites. We're going to go to Pisa. The city of Pisa is laid out from Piazza del Duomo, the place of the cathedral. This cathedral, ladies and gentlemen, is more than a thousand years of age, and it's famous not only for its age and its architecture, but uh, also because of some parishioners of whom we're going to speak in just a little bit. If you have an address in the city of Pisa, and it says 18 blocks north and 7 west, you know that that address is 18 blocks north of the cathedral and 7 blocks west of it. Now there is an American city that is laid out in the very same way, and I'll bet someone here knows which city it is. Which one? Not Washington, D.C., no? So there it is, Salt Lake City. That's right. It's laid out from the temple, Salt Lake City, in the very same sort of way. Well, <clears throat> when you say this name, by the way, don't call it pizza. <laughs> I've discovered the folks over there are just a little bit... <clears throat> disturbed when you call their city pizza it's pisa and 800 years ago it was twice the size that it is today two reasons for that it was a major university a major teaching center particularly with emphasis upon mathematics and other sciences and the other reason was it was 800 years ago a seaport I mean, it was a sailor town, and the ships dropped anchor a stone's throw from right here, <clears throat> and the sailors did commerce and brought a lot of money and unloaded and offloaded. And uh, that has all changed because the Arno River, the same Arno that runs through Florence, where we visited the Medici Chapel and those other famous places a few evenings ago, that same Arno runs here, ends here, and over the centuries it has dumped a delta here, so that it's now about seven and a half miles out to the Mediterranean Sea. So for those reasons, no longer a great university center, no longer a seaport center, and the city then has, um, has like not very many places in the world, gotten smaller and smaller and smaller still. And now from here we have a wonderful view of the Leaning Tower of Pisa. It is the Bell Tower. You probably knew that. And it is about 50 feet in diameter. It's about 150 feet high, uh, except to the top of the bells. And the final circle up there, that's another 20 or 30 feet high. And you can see how badly it leans. There has over the centuries been the worry, the real concern, that there might come an earthquake because there are faults in the area and the thing might topple down to the ground. Well, just a few years ago, they decided it was finally time to do something about it. And we'll talk about that something in just a little bit. First, however, let's look at the facade of this beautiful, beautiful cathedral. I want you to notice a number of things. Firstly, I want you to notice out on the corners, there are gargoyles. If we had a close-up, you could see that they're hideous-looking creatures. They're really ugly, kind of uh, dragon animal things with bared fangs. And they were put there for two reasons. One was practical, and the other was ridiculous. The practical is, they're the downspouts. When the rains run off of the stone roof, they run down to the gutters, and then make their way to the gargoyles, and the water goes inside the bodies of these gargoyles, and then spews out the mouth, and lands several feet away from the wall and the foundation that keeps the basement dry so that was the pack the practical side of it all the ridiculous side was these cathedrals many of them including this one were built during the dark ages where there's a great amount of superstition and folks really believed that if they would put these hideous dragon-like things around the corners of the church it would keep the devil from coming to church yeah ridiculous huh well look at the style this is a combination of what is called Tuscan and Romanesque, and we saw that also in Florence at the great cathedral of St. John the Baptist. I'm going to talk to you now about how history was made inside this church and about its most famous parishioner. 
We've alluded to him on prior evenings. His name was Galileo Galilee. Galileo was a child prodigy. Today we would say he was gifted. His daddy was a musician for two royal families, the Medici family over in Florence and the Ducal family over in Venice, the Doge. He was an organist of great repute and he was also a flautist. It was his desire that his son Galileo follow in his steps and perhaps become the musician, the chief musician for some king or queen of Europe. And so when he was just a little guy, Senior Galileo began to teach little Galileo how to play upon the organ. And by the time he was nine, ten years of age, they were duetting together. And it was quite remarkable. But by the time he was a young teenager, 13, 14, he was developing interest in another area. Mathematics, particularly as it was applied to the movements of the heavenly bodies and the great scheme of things time-wise. Now Galileo did not invent but did perfect the telescope and made it to be a very useful item. And by the time he was 1920, he had already spent years tracking the movements of the heavenly bodies in their orbits and measuring time and putting mathematical equations together that would shock teachers of math that had been around for many, many, many years. When he was still really basically a kid or, or surely just a young man, he was asked to come and be a, a fellow professor in the mathematics department here at the university. And while here, he would come to this church to worship on weekends. He would also come to just pray and, and meditate when the place was quite empty. He would come midweek and take a seat in a pew or perhaps kneel in front of a pew and just meditate. And on one such occasion, while he was meditating, praying, in came the caretaker. We would call him the janitor, I suppose. He had with him his high ladder, and he put the ladder up beside one of the chandeliers, climbed it, reached over and took hold of the chandelier that was hanging upon its chain, he trimmed the wick and filled the bowl and then released it and moved on, did the caretaker, to the next to the next. But Galileo was fascinated by the swinging of that first chandelier. For the longest time, back and forth it swung, back and forth. And from that happy accident in this church, the theory of pendulum motion was born. And all of the grandfather clocks, any pendulum clock, the metronome for the piano, and all of those devices were born here in the creative mind of Galileo Galilee. Now, he would get in trouble here, <clears throat> and, um, and it would nearly cost him his job, and some say almost his life. But before we talk about that, let's talk about this tower again. When first I visited here, you were allowed to after paying a few dollars go inside and climb the serpentine staircase and come out at each level or at whatever one you choose including the very top. They have in the last few years prevented that. They will not allow anyone to go inside and the major reason of course is the possibility that it could collapse. Now I'm going to tell you folks how badly it leans. If we were to go inside and go over to what they call the downhill side or the leaning side right here, and there we drop a plumb bob or we have a long string with a rock on it, we hold that right against the side up here and drop it, and when it hits the ground down here, it's going to be 18 feet away. That is a serious list, isn't it? That's, that's quite a lean. Well, why does it lean? Simply because it was not built upon solid ground. Built upon an ancient seabed, upon, you know, the sands of the old sea of the Mediterranean. 
and they didn't put proper foundation beneath it. And it began to tilt a little bit and then a little bit more in the pressure. The more it tilted, it would grow greater. And so they decided a few years ago they were going to do something about it. They sent out the problem to the major engineering schools of the world. And it was a young man from Massachusetts Institute of Technology that sent back a suggestion that was considered by the scholars to be the best of all. His idea was, we build a container around the whole tower. I mean, we put it inside a can, if you please. We make this container to be watertight. And then between the can, the inside wall of the can, and the wall of the tower, we put freezing rods, fill it with water, energize the rods, freeze the thing till it's encapsulated in an ice cube, maintain it in that suspended way, and then with great cranes, remove it, set it aside, and build sufficient foundation to hold it upright, and then reverse the process. Now that could be done and it wouldn't cost a great amount of money, but it hasn't been done and it won't be done. And I think you know why. There are thousands, yes, hundreds of thousands of people who every year bring multiplied millions of dollars to come and see the Leaning Tower of Pisa. And they know of certainty that there would be few people who would come and fewer, fewer dollars by far spent to see the straight tower of Pisa. But they did a few years ago become concerned enough to do something that they hoped would prevent it. From the uphill side, they began to auger at an angle, I think they said of around 18 degrees, six inch holes, bored six inch holes, several of them back underneath the uphill side with the idea that the thing might settle back the other way just a little bit. And it worked. It did that. It has worked. And um, in spite of that, they don't let folks go inside. And I think that is a really good idea. When I was here first, you were allowed to go inside, as I mentioned. And up near the top, I saw children, little children, I'm sure preschoolers, loose from their parents, and running around up there, and I thought that over, especially on the downhill side, the leaning side, it could be very dangerous because there are no restraints. There was no chain, there was no netting, there was no fencing, there was nothing. Now, after my first trip here, I came back and casually bumped into a lady who had been, once been uh, my parishioner, and she asked me where I'd been and what I enjoyed most of all. And I said, well, I made an amazing discovery, a shocking discovery at the Tower of Pisa. Oh, she said, my grandson from Seattle is going to go to Europe with a group of young people. I must tell my grandson to be sure and see the leaning Tower of Pisa. And she told her grandson, and he came to the leaning Tower of Pisa, and somehow... His 14-year-old grandson fell from the top to his death. So I'm glad they've stopped folks from going up inside. I'm really very thankful for that. But you can see folks up in there. By the way, I shot that picture from inside the main doorway, and it, it kind of makes the doorway look crooked, doesn't it? That is what in Idaho we call... An obstetrical illusion. <laughs> oh, enough silliness. Well, <clears throat> separate and apart from the cathedral and the tower is this building, circular and lovely and after the same style and the same design. And it was in there that I made the discovery that we're going to talk about tonight. This building, ladies and gentlemen, is the baptistry. Before we go inside, however, I'm going to tell you about a cemetery that is behind the wall. There's the wall. I wish that I had a picture, but it's, um, 
It's really only a cemetery, a graveyard with headstones and that sort of thing. Not so terribly unusual. But the cemetery itself has quite a history. While the cathedral a thousand years ago was under construction, <clears throat> the fathers of the city sent an armada of ships over to the Holy Land. And along the coasts of Palestine, the Holy Land, they dug up sand and dirt and took it aboard these ships. And then they brought it back and scattered it out over this ground that's behind the wall and began to sell cemetery plots with the guarantee from the church that if you're buried in this cemetery beneath the soil upon which the feet of the apostles and Jesus himself may have walked, you're guaranteed to come up in the first resurrection. And those cemetery plots sold out in a hurry. You can be sure of that. Well, what is the significance of this building, the baptistry? Let's go inside. In the very center and beneath the dome, there is a large baptismal font. Where I'm standing to shoot this picture, there is a little stairway where the pastor would climb up from the outside and then go down the stairs into the water. And there he would baptize. Now this I learned, ladies and gentlemen, that for the first 1,200 years of Christianity, every single person that was baptized was immersed totally, completely beneath the water. We last night over in the city of Rome went to the Pope's church, you remember? The Cathedral of St. John's Lateran. And I showed you last night the baptistry in which Constantine was immersed. For the first 1,200 years of Christianity, everybody that was baptized was baptized the Jesus way by immersion, laid back totally, completely beneath the water. And then in the 12th century, a change came in this way. Not from the Bible, but from a church leader, there came a doctrine called the doctrine of original sin. And a thumbnail sketch of that doctrine is this. As soon as a baby takes its first breath outside mother's womb, that infant is tainted with the sin that has been passed down generationally from Adam and Eve to the present. Original sin. And moreover, if that baby should die without the rite and the sacrament of baptism, that baby would go to limbo or perhaps purgatory or even something worse. Now suppose you're the mother or the grandmother, the baby is born, and as soon as the baby is born, as soon as the delivery is over, you know there's something wrong with this baby. Its skin is cyanotic, blue. It's not breathing properly. And we have no modern medicine, and we're quite sure the baby is not going to live, not for very long. What if our baby dies without baptism? And so we rush our baby down to the baptistry, and we pay the required fee. And the pastor goes over the side and into the water and over the wall we hand the pastor a baby and he puts the baby down beneath the cold water for this is long before they have the ability to heat the baptistries history says that many an infant ill or otherwise died as a result of the shock of being submersed in that cold water and especially if it's ill, you know, it, it simply adds to the, to the problem. And so an amendment was made. They said instead of handing the baby over and putting the baby down beneath the water, we shall into the water put a blanket, completely immerse, submerse the blanket, and then bring it out and wrap our baby in the blanket. And they did that. For a good while, but many children died as a result. Many babies were 
you know, shocked because of that. And by the way, it was from that experience in the baptistries and in the history of the church that there came a phrase that we still today use to about as popular as a wet blanket. Or he threw a wet blanket on my party, you know. The wet blanket expression came from this practice of the church. And so the church leadership said, well, we're going to make a little change because that's not so helpful. And so they then put a serviette or handkerchief in the tank and submersed it and put it upon the head of the infant or the older person, whomever. And then a few years after that, they changed again to what is still the practice, and that is the pouring upon the head of the person of a little water and calling it baptism. The question tonight is, does it matter? What difference does it make? We're going to learn the answer from our Bible again tonight. I must be sure to go on record to say, we're never going to hear sit in judgment upon anyone's relationship with Jesus, whether Catholic or Protestant or, or Muslim or whatever else. We never sit in judgment upon folks' relationship with God. But at the same time, we do have to look at teachings and practices and what prophecy says about them and the response of history. We have to ask here night by night, what is the will of Jesus? Wouldn't you agree with me that's what's important? What would Jesus say? What is the will of Jesus? And so we'll talk about that tonight. I want to thank you now for traveling with me. And now, ladies and gentlemen, our subject, Bible baptism. Is it important? Please open your Bibles with me, if you will, to Matthew's Gospel, chapter 28. This oftentimes is referred to as the 11th commandment. Sometimes it's also called the final marching orders of Jesus. Our Lord has come to the end of his ministry. This is 40 years, I'm sorry, 40 days rather. This has been 40 days after his resurrection. And just uh, hours perhaps before his ascension, and he gives to his disciples their final marching orders. So I'm going to read then from chapter 28 of Matthew's gospel, verses 19 and 20. The last words of Jesus the 11th commandment. Jesus said to his disciples, Go ye therefore and teach all nations, and then baptize them in the name of the Father and the Son and the, help me now, and the Holy Ghost, and teach them to observe all the things that I have commanded you. And lo, I'll be with you always, even to the end of the world. Amen. I have on various occasions had folks come to me and say, well, when it comes to this baptism business, I just personally don't think it matters. This way, that way, anyway, no way, it doesn't matter because baptism is only just a symbol. And if I say to you baptism is a symbol, that's correct, but a good deal hangs on the way that I say it and perhaps even the tone and intonation that I use to say it. I remember a senior citizen, an old gentleman who had never been baptized. And we were making an appeal to the man, you ought to be baptized. And he kind of put his hands on his hips and he said, it doesn't matter. It's only just a symbol, just a symbol, that's all. And then he was asked, sir, have you ever been married? And he instantly softened. Oh, yes, he said, I was married to the sweetest girl for more than 50 years, and she recently passed away. Did you love your wife, sir? Oh, more than life. Did your wife ever kiss you? And the tears came. Oh, yes. Every morning, every night, every time I left the house. Well, that kiss was only a symbol. I 
I have another symbol in my pocket here, I believe. Yeah, surely enough. What do you think? Oh, by the way, had I presented this message 10 days from now, instead of showing you this with fives in the corners, I could have shown you one with 20s in the corners because our check would have come and Peggy would have given me my allowance. <laughs> she never fails. I mean, within a day or two after the check clears the bank, I'll find in my wallet or in my pocket a crisp $20 bill. Sometimes if things are good, I might even find an additional one there. My allowance is always on time. But you know what? It's only a symbol. And nearly every week of my ministry, I visit with someone or see someone, a neighbor perhaps, who is killing himself with a symbol. It's become vitally important to them. They're spending 60, 70, 80 hours a week and then half of the night playing with the computer trying to get more of this. It's only a symbol. There are other symbols in the church that many consider to be sacred. I am one of them. One of those happens to be the Lord's Supper. Do you partake of the Lord's Supper when you worship? Yeah, of course. But are there only symbols? That bit of bread, that juice. Jesus himself said, this symbolizes my body that was broken for you. This symbolizes my, my, my blood spilled for you. But they're vitally important symbols. Life is filled with very important symbols. Bible baptism, ladies and gentlemen, symbolizes three very important things, and I'm going to underline them, and then I'm going to enumerate them to some larger degree. It symbolizes birth, new birth particularly. It symbolizes, moreover, marriage, becoming a part of the bride of Christ. Further, it symbolizes death, death to sin and death to the old way of living. Our Lord Jesus said, you must be born of the water, John chapter 3. We may refer to that again as time allows. And then baptism symbolizes marriage, a marriage to Jesus, becoming part of his bride. I've often been asked, Lyle, how can I be sure that I'm a part of the bride of Christ? Because in Matthew chapter 25, there the parable of the virgins, five wise and five otherwise, it says at midnight the cry went up, Behold, the bridegroom cometh, go ye out to meet him. And the bride, of course, is the church. And you come to Revelation chapter 19, and there at about verse 7, 8, and 9, it says about our Lord Jesus that his bride has made herself ready. And to her is granted that she be dressed in garments pure and white, for the white garments symbolize the righteousness of the saints. And so sometimes I'm asked, how may I be absolutely certain that I'm part of the bride, that I'm ready? And sometimes, in partial answer at least, I ask them, have you been baptized? Because in a symbolic, in a vitally important symbolic way, baptism is a marriage to Jesus Christ and becoming part of the family. And I want to say to you, it's the happiest family I have ever found. A wonderfully happy family. Welcoming into the family at baptism. That means that we're going to have support and we're going to have encouragement. And we need that in these days and times, don't we now? We need it desperately. Uh, encouraging one another. I was reading the other evening a story about the Special Olympics from some magazine. Doesn't matter which one. You know about the Special Olympics. Those that are held for children that uh, uh, are not as well off as we are physically or perhaps mentally. Or they're challenged in some way or another. And they were doing the 100-yard dash. And there was one that had really been practicing. I mean, this guy had been working and working and working for more than a year for the Special Olympics. And they shot off the gun, and he went from the blocks. And just a little bit, he was well ahead of the others. He came to the first curb, first curb, and he stumbled, and he fell. And do you know what the others did? You'd have thought they'd have passed him by and said goodbye, sorry, too bad for you. No, they all stopped and helped him up and then walked across the finish line together. And that's the way it ought to be in the church, especially in the last days. 
Hebrews chapter 10, 25, Forsake not the assembling of yourselves together as the manner of some is, and much more as you see the last day approaching. And so this idea of being part of the bride of Christ is being welcomed into the family and uh, encouragement shared with those that share like beliefs and like faith. Our Lord Jesus is our one and only bridegroom. I want to read a scripture with you right now. So go with me to Galatians chapter 3. Galatians chapter 3, and there's so many folks who really love the gospel that love Galatians and Ephesians. They're similar in so many ways and yet different in some. Romans and Galatians and Ephesians. Galatians chapter 3, and I want to read for us tonight verse 27. Galatians 3, 27. Here's what Paul, God through Paul rather, says to us. For as many of you as have been baptized into Christ have put on Christ. You know what the bottom line symbolism is? It means that at this point, you, we too have become one. Does that remind you a little bit of your marriage ceremony? It's not right that man should live alone. Therefore God has said that man ought marry and you too become one. And baptism brings that symbol and it's a beautiful one. And then it symbolizes death. Death to the former life. Death to the old self. Death to the lusts. And, and death to the practices that destroy the home and the family and disrupt the community. It symbolizes death and burial. At the instant, the one who comes to baptism is lowered back into the water. That person is saying, by this beautiful symbol, I believe that Jesus Christ died for me. And in that brief instant that the person is lowered totally, completely beneath the water, he, she is saying by that symbolic deed and act, I know that Jesus Christ was buried in my place. His death, his burial was for me. And in the instant that that person is raised up out of the water dripping wet, he is saying symbolically, I know that Jesus was raised for me and he now lives and intercedes for me. Bible baptism symbolizes death. It symbolizes burial, and it also symbolizes resurrection. Now, folks, you know surely the difference between burying that which is dead and sprinkling it a little bit. <laughs> Bury the past. And with bearing the past, there comes a ridding of guilt and those complexes. There's a wiping away of the slate. There's a starting anew with Jesus Christ. And I have discovered that those who really understand baptism and go into it with, with the fullness of that understanding, their lives change. No one, by the way, had to explain to me the power of the gospel of Jesus Christ because I saw it demonstrated in my own daddy. And one of these times soon, an evening or two, I'm going to tell you our family story once again. My dad, let me just shorten it to tell you, was an alcoholic by the time he was 20 years of age. And he had no religious background, none whatsoever. And by the time I was first able to understand him, I could hear those Filthy, filthy words that he spoke. Hardly a sentence without three or four expletives deleted. And he had some other habits that, that were life-destroying and, and were not pleasant to be around. And then he found Jesus Christ. And I want to tell you that when my daddy came up out of the water, he was indeed born again. And all of that passion, all of the guilt that went with it was left in the tank behind him. He was washed clean and remade. He had died to self and left it behind him and was raised to walk in newness, newness of life. How many of you folks think that Christians ought to be the happiest people in the world? You believe that? Yeah, we ought to have clear consciences and clear minds. How many of you think that Christians ought to talk differently from the average man on the street? I think we should. We ought to have that pure language that the Bible says we're going to have in the earth made new. They shall call on my name with one accord, and I'll give them a pure language. And we ought to begin to practice that now like we practice these other things that get us ready for the kingdom of God. We ought to be the happiest people. Our language ought to be different. How many of you think that Christians 
ought to act differently and, and to go to perhaps different places than the average of the street, huh? Sure, we ought to be different. We ought to be the happy. We, we know where we've come from. We know why we're here and we know where we're going. We should be the happiest people on the face of God's earth. How many of you believe it now? Can we see you? I want to see your hands now. Well, now look, some of you need to tell your faces. <laughs> yeah, we ought to be the happiest people all the world now. Some of us looked like we were weaned on pickle juice. <laughs> well, happiest folks on earth, changed and different, different from the rest of the world. Unfortunately, these days, some folks go to church and, and they're even baptized and you can't tell them from the folks that go to the bar and some of the rest of the places. It was Billy Sunday whose biography I was reading not so very long ago and he put it this way. I felt, felt that at the outset it was a little crude but there may be a lot of truth in it. He said, Christians have lowered the bar and the standard so low that any old hog with two suits can get in. <laughs> the Christians are different. God through Peter in 1 Peter chapter 2 verse 9 said... I want you to be a peculiar people. And that didn't mean weird. It didn't mean some strange thing that stands on the street corner and shouts. It simply means we ought to be different. We ought to act differently. We ought to look differently. We ought to, uh, to go to different places than the average person in the world. Now, we're going to go once more to the last commandment of Jesus. Matthew chapter 28. We'll review it and then we're going to put together with it a similar verse from Mark's gospel. We need to review. And by the way, I'm going to suggest, folks, that you memorize this verse, or these two verses, because they're so very, very important. Matthew 28, verses 19 and 20 once again. Go ye therefore, the commandment of Jesus, the 11th, go ye therefore and baptize all nations, now, what Jesus is saying is, I want you to go to Moses Lake, but I also want you to go to Mankato, Minnesota. I want you to go to Payot, Idaho, but I also want you to go to the Philippines. I want you to go to the Alta Plain of Bolivia, but I also want you to go to the Gobi Desert. I want you to go to that remote place way out there in the Nevada desert where only three or four folks live, but at the same time, I want you to go into the ghetto of the inner city. I want you to go to the whole world. You must go everywhere. Every man must be given this opportunity. Every person, every child must hear of my righteousness and my grace go into the whole world and teach the gospel this good news that I have died for them. I have been buried for them. I have risen again and I now live to intercede. Go and tell everybody. And when this job is done, I'll come again. And in the interim, I will be with you until the job is completed. That's good news. That's really good news. When I was sent out on a job that was tough, off times my daddy-in-law would go with me. Experienced. Knew how to do it. I wouldn't be alone. And if it didn't work out exactly right, uh, I could share the blame, you know. Well, the boss was with me. I'll be with you to the very end, always. Now, without any transition, we're going to go from here to Mark's gospel, and we're going to read the famous last words of Jesus as Mark remembered them. And by the way, really, this is Peter's remembrance because the gospel of Mark is really the gospel according to Peter. Mark was not one of the original 12 disciples, but rather was a traveling companion of Peter. And Peter would go here and there, and Mark, as his secretary, go with him, and he'd write down whatever Peter had said. And so we're going to read now something that Peter remembered of the final commandment of Jesus, the famous last words of Jesus, Mark chapter 16, verses 15 and 16. He said, Go into all the world and preach the gospel to every person, and he that believeth and is... Now you tell me what it says baptized the same shall be saved our Lord Jesus connected Bible baptism with eternal life he that believes and is baptized shall be saved and the clear inference is 
that if you don't believe, you'll not be baptized. You see? Here, our Lord Jesus himself connected Bible baptism with eternal life. He that believes and is baptized is going to be saved in my kingdom. Now, I need to talk to you for just a little bit about the word itself. Baptize. It is a New Testament word. It is a Greek word. And the root form is baptizo, which means I baptize. The verb form, I baptize, baptizo. It has taken on kind of a, kind of a churchy context since its relationship with Jesus and the church and the disciples and the commission and the example of Jesus, of course. But it was an everyday common household sort of a word. When the ladies were doing the dishes, they were baptizing. That's exactly right. When they were washing their husband's shirts, they were baptizing them. And you ladies, again, know the difference between sprinkling the dishes and baptizing them. It does make a difference to those that say, well, look, it's unimportant. Do it this way or that way or don't do it at all. What does it matter? It matters not. No, the word means only to submerse and to immerse. And I'm going to read you a couple of quotations, and then I'm going to make a statement that I hope doesn't sound harsh. I don't mean it in that context. And yet at the same time, I have to make it so clear that children can understand. So you listen. A man wrote to Dr. Martin Luther, whom I believe to be one of the greatest Christians and certainly one of the greatest New Testament scholars since the Apostle Paul. A man wrote to Dr. Martin Luther over in Germany, and he asked him this question. I have been asked to baptize a certain gentleman. How should I go about it? And Martin Luther wrote back, and I'm going to read you what he said. You must fill a large tub completely with water. And having divested this man of his clothing, I ask you, please cover him with a white garment. Then you ask him to sit down in the tub, and you must baptize him completely beneath the water. Yeah, Martin Luther. John Wesley, another one of my heroes, the originator of the Methodist Church. Someone asked him about baptism, and here's what he said. It was certainly the method of Jesus and the practice, the only practice, of the early Christian church. Yeah. Martin Luther again, he said, the act or rite of baptism consists in being placed inside the water which flows over us and, and, and being drawn up from the water again. These two things, being placed in the water and the waters flowing over us and emerging then from it signify the power and the efficacy of God in Bible baptism. And he's exactly right. And so another quotation quickly, or maybe a couple. Martin Luther, and I'm quoting, said, in the Greek language, to baptize signifies only to submerse and to dip, and I could wish that all of the baptized be totally immersed. You wonder sometimes, don't you, why those who take his name nowadays don't follow his own beliefs in so many areas. John Calvin, the Presbyterian reformer, said, and I quote, the very word baptize means to immerse, and it's certain that immersion was the only practice of the Christian church. Now listen, please, very carefully. If you as a child or an adult or whatever were sprinkled upon or poured upon, surely it has been recorded in the big book, the book of life, that you were dedicated or that your parents were dedicated to raise you to know and love Jesus. But if you were sprinkled or poured upon, and have not yet been immersed, it has not yet been recorded in God's book that you've been baptized. To submerse, that's what it always only means. Well, those say, well, it's unimportant, it's unnecessary, it doesn't matter. He does it this way, she does it that way, some don't do it at all. It's so what it just assemble, it doesn't matter. Listen, if I take that position, I am sitting in judgment upon the mind of God Almighty. How dare any of us, how dare any of us to tell God he doesn't know the difference between commandments and teachings and examples that are important and those that are unimportant. How dare any of us sit in judgment 
upon the mind of Almighty God. Jesus said, I am the way, I am the truth, and I am the life. And that's from John's Gospel, chapter 14, verse 6. We've used it before. The way and the truth and the life. And from 2 Peter chapter 2, verse 21, there we're told again, Christ is our example that we ought to walk in his footsteps. And when it came to the example regarding baptism, you know well what Jesus did, don't you? He gave us an example as to how to live and how to conduct ourselves in every area of Christian endeavor. When it came to the idea of rest and worship, he kept the Sabbath. It was his custom. He exampled us that Saturday is the day of rest and worship. When it came to baptism, he told us and taught us not only by his mouth, but also by his example. And maybe we ought to read it. Shall we, we do that together? Let's do it. Matthew chapter 3. One of the two places where the baptism of Jesus is very, very clearly spelled down. Matthew's Gospel, chapter 3, and we'll read at verse 15. Matthew chapter 3, reading the 15th verse. Matthew three fifteen. Jesus went to John the Baptist, and then it says, verse 15, And Jesus answering said to John the Baptist, Suffer it to be so. New translation say, Allow me, please. Don't forbid me. Suffer to be so, for thus it becometh us to fulfill all righteousness. And then John baptized him. And then Jesus, when he was baptized, straightway he wiped the water off his forehead. Is that what it says in your Bible? Huh? He, he flipped the, that that was on his hair off. What does it say then? Straightway Jesus came up out of the water. It wasn't that a little water was on him, somehow poured or sprinkled, but rather that he was totally and completely immersed down beneath the water. He's my example in every area. And thus it becometh us to fulfill all righteousness, he said. And that word righteousness has a basic meaning of right doing. Jesus said, I've come here to show you how to do it right. I've exampled you as to how to do it right. Jesus was determined to leave no question as to how right ought be done. When Jesus concluded his ministry in John's Gospel, chapter 17, verse 4, John 17, verse 4, put it in your notes. I hadn't meant to bring it up, but it just came into my mind, so I'm going to share it with you. Jesus, in his great high priestly prayer, said to the Father at the end of his ministry, I have finished all of the work that you gave me to do. And part of that was exampling us as to how we ought to be baptized. I have finished all of the work that you gave me to do. Now listen, ladies and gentlemen. When it dawned upon my mind what Jesus had done for me, when I came to realize all that he had given up for me, that he, Jesus, the creator of the universe, had stepped off his throne where he had for eternity been worshipped and adored, stepped off his throne and stepped down beneath the rest of the God family, stepped down lower than angels, came down to this earth, and here didn't wear a crown. Here he stepped down beneath the dignity of kings and queens. Here he became less than presidents or senators. Here on this earth he was willing to become a tiny baby in a stinky cow barn. And the Bible says he would have done that if there was only one lost sheep. Had I been the only one, he would have stepped off the throne and given his life for me. He would have died in my place. He would have been buried in my place. He would have risen for me. And when that realization caught my mind, then I wanted a baptism that went all the way for him. No halfway business for me. No. I wanted a dedication of my hands to do his work, my feet to run his errands, my ears to hear his Holy Spirit, my eyes to see his goodness, my lips to sing his praise. My hands reach out and bless. I wanted the total dedication of myself to the Jesus who gave everything for me. I remember early in my ministry, very early, 
In baptism, one of my best buddies, his name was Charles Fulmore. Some of you know him as Chuck, the Chuck and Donna Fulmore trio, huh? Yeah. And he'd slipped away from Jesus, and he wanted a rededication. And so he came to the pastor. And the pastor happened to be a dear friend of mine. In fact, I followed him in the district, and those were big, big shoes to fill. His name was Pastor Willard Kaufman, and he happened to be a brother of Alice Morgan. How about that, huh? And Chuck went to Willard, and he said, I want to be baptized. And Pastor Willard said, fine, let's do it. And Chuck said, there's just one thing. He said, I've always had a problem with, with being honest with my money. And so he said, when I go in the baptistry, I want to be able to go in there with my wallet in my pocket. Is that all right? All right. And so Chuck baptized his wallet, a total dedication, because Jesus had done everything for him, and he's done the same for you. Now, I want you to turn with me, please, to Colossians chapter 2, and we're going to notice verse 12. Colossians chapter 2, and we're noticing together verse 12. And we're going to find this so very helpful this evening. Colossians 2, verse 12, it says, Buried with him in baptism, wherein we are also risen with him through faith, through the operation of God who has raised him from the dead. Baptism. God's working through us. Baptism is a public demonstration of our faith in God. It is a public statement of, of our declaration of our faith in Him because of all that He's done for us. And God is watching. You remember what Jesus said in Matthew chapter 10, verse 32, Whosoever confesses me before men, him will I also confess before my Father in heaven. And so Jesus' heart is thrilled when we make the public declaration and we are baptized in a public way. God is watching. His heart is thrilled. I read the other day about a little girl who was standing up against a big plate glass window during a violent thunder and electrical storm. And the lightning was flashing and mother came into the family room and saw the little girl there pressed up against the glass. She said, honey, get away from her. Get back, get back. Oh, no, she said, I can't. I can't do it. God's taking my picture. God's watching. <laughs> He who confesses me, him will I also confess before my Father. Now I've been asked on many occasions, Lyle, what about being baptized the second time? I've been immersed the Jesus way. I've had some who've gone so far as to show me a scripture that they have felt precludes them from being baptized a second time. And it's in Ephesians chapter 4, verse 5. We'll just allude to it very briefly here. Ephesians chapter 4, verse 5, where it says, One Lord and one faith and one baptism. And some have gotten the mistaken notion that it's sort of like taking cookies to school on your little boy's birthday and they're only just enough, one for each child. And some little guy comes up and says, Teacher, could I have two? Oh, no, son, I'm sorry. We only have barely enough to go around, just one, huh? No, that's not what God's talking about here. He's not talking about numbers. He's talking about modality. He's talking about methodology. There's one true Lord. How many of you believe that? One true Lord, that's our Lord Jesus. One true faith, that's the faith of Jesus. You need not raise your hand, but ask your heart, what about one true baptism? It becomes obvious now that there are many man-made additions and substitutions. Is it all right to be rededicated in the water baptism? Yes. Let's go to Acts chapter 19. We said the other evening that the book of Acts is the history of the first 30 years of the Christian church. And in chapter 19, we're going to begin to read at verse 1, and we're going to learn something that relates directly to our subject matter tonight. It came to pass while Paul was... A, while Apollos, rather, was in Corinth. Came to pass while Apollos was in Corinth, Paul, having passed through the upper coast, came to Ephesus, and he found certain believers there, and he asked them, Have you received the Holy Ghost since you were baptized? And they said to him, We'd not heard there was such thing as a Holy Ghost. He asked them, Unto what then were you baptized? And they said unto him, Unto John's baptism. Now, the John spoken of here is John the Baptist. Was there anything wrong with his baptism? Huh? 
Of course not. He baptized Jesus. There was nothing wrong with his baptism. And so Paul goes on. Verse 4, Paul then said, John verily baptized with the baptism of repentance, saying to the folks that they should believe on he who was to come after, that is on Jesus Christ. And when they heard this, they were baptized again in the name of Jesus Christ. The context here, my dears, is abundantly clear. That when folks grew in grace, when they learned more, when they got near to Jesus, they were rewashed, rededicated. I have had the happy privilege in the last near 40 years now, to be a part of the baptizing of around 5,000 people. And I praise God, everyone is special, everyone is precious. Among the thousands, there have certainly been dozens, dozens, who've said to me, you know, Lyle, I didn't know until just recently, I didn't recognize until now that unwittingly I was breaking one of the Ten Commandments. I didn't know until just recently that I was breaking the Lord's Day, which is Saturday. I want to be rededicated. I want to be baptized into that. And many have been. I remember being down in Warner Roberts, Georgia, preaching as I'm doing now. And coming night after night was a man and his wife. And I went to the home to visit to discover that the man had for more than 37 years been a pastor of a Southern Baptist church. And they came every night, every night. And they learned about the Sabbath and want to be a part of it. And they learned about some of these other wonderful truths and want to be a part of it. Want to be a part of this last day movement. And so Bill Thompson asked me if I'd baptize him. And I shall never forget, when I raised him up out of the water, he looked out to the congregation. He said, you know, brother, sister, I have been a pastor for nearly 40 years. And all of those 40 years, though I knew Jesus and knew the gospel, I also knew something was missing. And now I know what it was. And that man began to hold Revelation seminars. And until his death in Oklahoma, he continued to write me or phone me, Lyle, where's that quotation? Where can I, where's the answer to this? He was rededicated in Jesus because of his love for him. He that believes and is baptized, the same shall be saved. Let's pray. Jesus, dear, thank you for these many decisions made tonight to walk in the water with you. Don't let anything or anyone turn these dear folks from this decision. I beg you, in Jesus' name, amen.